Next up on our summit main stage, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Ann Savage, the Executive Director of Proyecto TT. Hey, John, thank you so much for the invitation to join all of you today. You're welcome. You're welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, and I've got a, a, quite, a, quite a bio to read for you. You've got an incredible background that I'm excited to share with our viewers here. Great. So as a world traveler, Dr. Savage has spent her professional career establishing conservation programs for endangered species. She developed Proyecto TT, a conservation program designed to conserve Colombia's most endangered primate, the cotton top tamarind. Proyecto TT has been a terrific success, garnering national and international attention for their efforts to create protected areas for wildlife. Dr. Savage created the Cotton Top Tamarin SSP for the Association for Zoos and Aquariums, helping more than 300 accre accredited zoos and aquariums in managing the genetic diversity of cotton top tamarins. Dr. Savage is the former conservation director for Walt Disney Parks and Resorts and helped to develop Disney's conservation programs for numerous species. Dr. Savage has been funded by the National Science Foundation, the World Wildlife Fund, National Geographic Research and Exploration, and many national and international agencies for her various studies. She is the recipient of the Explorers Club Lowell Thomas Award and the John Muir Conservation Award. Dr. Savage offers a rare expertise and a unique opportunity to apply some of the lessons learned from managing primate genetic diversity to canids. Thank you again for joining us. It's my pleasure. And I'm so excited to be able to share the work that we do with a little monkey that's known as the cotton top tamarind. And I'm not sure if people uh, are incredibly familiar with it, but cotton tops are known for having one of the best hairdos in the primate world. And, um, you know, when we think about great hairdos, you know, we think about, oh, what does that really mean? Well, we know cotton tops win primates. There's another little animal, uh, a fun little bat called the Chapin's bat that seems to have the same idea of wanting to be a little punky, right? But we all know that when it comes to the best hairdo, poodles win hands down. So um, that's my sort of little introduction to how cotton tops and poodles are connected. But actually there's some really fun things about cotton tops um, that I wanted to share with you today and try to find some additional connections between these cute little monkeys and canids. So as you can see, cotton top tamarins are tiny little monkeys. They uh, weigh about a pound, and I've been working with them since I was a student at the University of Wisconsin, so since I was 19 years old. And I worked with them initially uh, at the university, and then I started the very first field study on cotton tops. And the reason I did that is because, you know, while it's great to be able to study these animals in captivity, and, you know, I was very fortunate to be able to work in this great lab where we were learning all about how to breed them successfully and manage them successfully, but cotton tops are an endangered species. And if we really want to conserve an endangered species, we need to work with them in the wild. And so one of the things that I really wanted to do is understand what makes cotton tops so unique when it comes to this species. And in particular, what do we need to do to help manage this species, both in the wild and in captivity? So one of the things that's really interesting about cotton tops and, and this primate species is a bit unique from a lot of other primates is that cotton tops actually live in families. There's, uh, they're basically a monogamous pair. So there's a male and a female and the majority of the animals in the group are their offspring. And in captivity, there is no way to introduce unrelated animals into groups. So if you were to try and put in, for example, if you wanted to replace the new breeding, uh, put in a new breeding male, you'd have to basically disband the whole group because cotton tops don't like their neighbors. They don't like strangers. And that's the same thing in the wild. A pair of cotton top tamarins are basically will stay together until either an animal gets evicted from the group because there's a, an intruder coming in trying to replace them or an animal dies. So they have a very strong bond between the two of them the adult male and female. And that is something that's, that's pretty unique. So when it comes to managing the species, that becomes quite challenging because, you know, if you've got an entire family that you're trying to deal with, it can be a bit, um, a bit more problematic. Now, the other thing that's challenging about cotton tops is everything that they need to uh, survive is learned. 
So unlike a lot of species of canids where many things are instinctual, that's not the case for primates. With primates, everything is learned even down to simple things of what food they should eat. You know, as you can imagine in the tropical forest where these animals are found in Colombia, uh, they can come across a lot of different things. And in the wild, they eat primarily fruit and insects. But we all know that there are some insects that are poisonous. And so um, cotton tops learn which fruits to eat and what insects and other things to avoid by the, watching their parents. And the other thing is that uh, animals in the social group, like you see here, uh, it will food share. So that's how the youngsters learn what to eat. They also need to learn predators. Uh, cotton tops, as you can imagine, being a tasty little one pound morsel, uh, tend to be favored by a lot of raptors, particularly when they're tiny like this, and, and snakes. And so they have to be very, very careful and they have a variety of different vocalizations. In fact, cotton tops have over 90 different vocalizations. Uh, some of those are used for alarm, uh, but they also can communicate about the different types of food. They also have um, calls for when they're separated from the group so they can find themselves uh, back together. But the thing that's most fascinating is that babies, just like human babies, will go through a babbling sequence. So when you're watching cotton tops, you'll see them just sort of sitting, young babies will sit out there and they just practice all these crazy calls. And you can tell that they're not giving them in the appropriate context but the parents will sort of come around and sort of watch them and look at them and think, well, I guess they're just practicing. But the way they learn, they can make the calls, but they don't know how to deliver them until it's the appropriate context. And that's even the same sort of thing when it comes to looking at where they sleep. Now, as you can imagine, being that one pound tasty morsel, there's a lot of things that are always looking to eat them. So cotton tops never use the same sleeping site. Uh, day after day, they have a series of them that they use. And they typically like to sleep in trees that are covered by strangling vines or um, anything that sort of covers them. And they sleep in a giant group with the babies sort of tucked in the middle and everybody sleeps on top of one another. And as you can imagine, they're given, given this social group, there's a lot of things that they have to learn. So for example, um, play behavior is actually something that's learned. And while if they're in a group with a lot of siblings, which is typically the case, uh, they tend to play a lot with their siblings, but there's that fine line between play and aggression. And you know, you can tell that parents typically have less tolerance for play than the siblings do. So when cotton top tamarind babies try to initiate play with their parents, they will oftentimes get smacked away and the parents are like, you know, we don't wanna play. If you wanna go play, go play with your brothers and sisters. But that's really how cotton tops can learn um, the social norms, because as you can imagine, uh, there are certain things that you can do and certain things you can't do in a social group. And particularly when it comes to uh, looking at sort of the hierarchy within the group, as we know the adult pair, the breeding pair, are the most dominant in the group, and they sort of decide what happens. Um, and the other thing that's really quite interesting is that uh, adult females can actually suppress the fertility of their daughters. So as long as cotton top tamarins live at home with their mom, live in the same social group, even though they've gone through puberty, they will not have organized cycles in the presence of their, their mom. The only way to get organized cycles is to have a novel male come into the group. And so that means in from a captive setting, either removing the daughter from a family and pairing her with a new male, or in the wild is the female may leave the group and pair up with a, a novel male, a new male, and then she'll start her own breeding group. The other thing that's really fascinating about cotton tops is that parental care is also learned. So when a cotton top is growing up in its family, not only do they play with their siblings, but they carry these babies on their back. Females typically give birth to twins once a year and everybody in the group helps to take care of the babies. So mom is just really around for nursing, but it's dad, brothers and sisters that all carry the babies, share food with the babies and play with them and teach them all the different things that they need to survive. And so this is something that's really sort of different from a lot of uh, animal species in the internal, the amount of investment that the parents make in their offspring. So uh, cotton tops are, you know, by the time they're about 12 weeks of age, then they become a bit more independent from their caregivers but they really do depend on their parents for about the first year of life. And they'll go through puberty at between 10 to 12 months. 
And so you think about that, that's a pretty advanced state when it comes to a small one body, one pound primate to be able to do all of this stuff so quickly. Now, with this tiny little monkey, one of the things that is interesting is that they're found only in the country of Colombia. And not only are they restricted to the country of Colombia, but they're also very restricted to the northwest region of the Colum of Colombia. So they are found in semi-dry tropical forests, and they have been really um, decimated by habitat destruction and a, a lot of um, capture, both for the scientific use as well as the illegal pet trade. And one of the things that was um, very interesting is cotton tops came into captivity because they were brought in as the alternative to the rhesus monkey. Uh, everyone thought that this little one pound monkey would be a lot easier to house than the larger rhesus monkeys and you could basically put more animals together. So in the late 60s and early 70s, between 20 to 30,000 cotton top tamarins were exported from Colombia to the US for use in biomedical research. What we learned very quickly is that you can't house cotton tops like you do rhesus monkeys that live in multi-male, multi-female groups. Cotton tops have to be paired, males and females, and they have to be visually isolated from their neighbors because they're so incredibly territorial. And if you don't visually isolate them, all they do is fight um, between the cages. So um, over the time that they were in captivity, one of the things that uh, became very important to the biomedical community is that Cotton top tamarins became a very unique model for a human disease. Cotton tops spontaneously developed colon cancer in captivity. Now, we've never observed it in, in the wild, at least not to the same level that we have seen in uh, captivity. Now, that could be that animals die before we were able to uh, you know, see them in the, in the wild. But I can tell you from years and years of working with them both in captivity and in the wild, we never see cotton tops that show those sort of classical symptoms of an animal that's dealing with colon cancer in captivity. So with all of these animals that came into captivity, both in the biomedical community and then they became um, popular in the zoo community, um, there was really a need to start managing this species responsibly. And so in the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, known as the AZA, um, there is a, uh, the way that uh, animals are, are managed is through stud books. So there are both regional and international stud books. And cotton tops are found through all the major zoo associations. So there's a very large uh, population of cotton tops in Europe and in Australia, and of course here in the United States and in Canada. And basically there uh, is a listing of every single animal that has come into captivity or as far back as we can trace them. And then using that information, uh, the cotton top tamarind species survival plan was born. And that was back in uh, the 1990s, basically. I started that through the AZA. And that allows us to basically manage the genetic diversity of our animals in uh, managed care in zoos. Now, the reason that we want to do this is that one, there was a big interest in understanding where there was a genetic component to colon cancer. As you can imagine, there was a lot of interest in trying to understand why cotton tops developed this disease. Um, sadly, we've never really figured out why they developed this disease. It does not appear to have a genetic component. Um, there are some scientists that seem to think that it may be due to a metabolic issue because um, cotton tops in Colombia live in a very hot tropical um, area. And in fact, some of the places they, they were suggesting is that we keep them too cold in captivity. And maybe that might be one of the reasons why they develop this. Obviously, another thing is diet. Uh, what they eat in the wild is very different from what we were feeding them in captivity, even though we tried to develop the best possible diet for them based on the information that we had at hand. Um, but it's a very difficult uh, decision trying to understand how to make the, the best possible diet for these animals. Um, the other challenge is, of course, that we wanted to, when you're dealing with an endangered species, you can't uh, now legally import them from Colombia to any place. And so we had to uh, learn how we could best manage the genetic diversity of these animals so that we could be very responsible in caring for them and have a very successful self-sustaining captive breeding population. So when we think about the population of cotton tops and how they're managed, um, in the zoo population, we do that through the use of these regional international stud books. So every animal is registered in 
the uh, stud books, and we can then look to make breeding transfers and breeding plans to promote the population management. Now, the challenge, of course, as you can imagine, is it's not that easy because there's a lot of different things that we have to take into consideration. We can't just swap males and females very easily. Um, uh, one of the challenges that we had is when we first began with uh, the Cotton Top SSP, there were over 300 cotton tops, um, sorry, there were uh, over 300 institutions that were involved in, um, in managing cotton tops around the world. Here in the United States, we have uh, reduced our population. And the reason being is that we wanted to make sure that we were maintaining the um, highest diversity, genetic diversity. Um, one of the biggest challenges, of course, as you can imagine, is I would love to have cotton top tamarins in every single zoo. And I would love every single zoo to have multiple groups of cotton top tamarins. But as you can imagine, there's limited space. So what we have to do is really balance the genetic value and the behavior and, and social needs of the species with the institutional needs uh, of the groups that are housing these animals. So it becomes a sort of very complex dance of how we go about managing these animals. Um, now, I will say, you know, in the, the world of canids, you guys are much farther advanced than we are when it comes to looking at the genetics of our population. Given that we're dealing with a non-human primate, uh, we thought that we could easily use a lot of the genetic markers that are used in humans uh, to understand the genetic diversity of cotton top tamarins and other primates. And while that may work well for many primate species, for cotton top tamarins, the markers that are currently available do not show, uh, they don't basically differentiate um, animals in, with cotton top tamarins. That's also kind of interesting because cotton top tamarins are blood chimeric, meaning that they share the same uh, uterus uh, in, in, when in utero, and so they have the same blood supply. So the typical things that have worked really well in human uh, looking at gene diversity has not worked very well with uh, cotton top tamarins. However, there is hope on the horizon. Um, the other thing, so with the fact that we haven't been able to uh, use genetic markers to be able to manage our population. Uh, most zoos and aquariums, when they're managing populations, they're doing it based on mean kinship, which is how related this one individual is to everybody else in the population. Um, so all of our stud books uh, that have animals registered in them, trace them back to when they were either born into um, a colony or back into the wild. And so this allows us to really uh, have a good idea of how related everybody is to one another. There is a slight problem with the uh, issue of mean kinship, and that is all animals that started out as founders, so that came in from the wild, we had no idea if they were related or not. So everyone was assumed to be a founder. So that's a, a, a flaw in it. However, I will tell you that the genetics of our populations in captivity, because we work so long and hard uh, to make sure that we maintain good genetic diversity, is was at 93% genetic diversity based on the techniques that we currently have available for us. The other challenge that we have is this issue of social behavior. Because cotton tops uh, live in these families, it's very difficult to integrate new animals into social groups. So if you happen to have you know, a male with high mean kinship and a female with low mean kinship, uh, you don't want to mix them together. You should be breeding um, all low mean kinships together because those animals aren't represented in your population. But that means you have to break up the pair and more than likely they have uh, sibling, infants or, or um, offspring in the group. Now that's fine if the older animals have infant caretaking experience, but the challenge becomes the youngest animals in the group. Those animals aren't gonna have infant caretaking experience. And then the problem becomes when they're old enough to reproduce, they won't have the skills to be successful parents. And it becomes a, a bit of a challenge. And there is a policy where we don't hand rear these monkeys because they don't develop uh, the social norms or understand um, how to really be successful in social groups, even though we try and integrate them back into their uh, social group uh, as soon as we possibly can. They just are somewhat different than animals that are weird with their parents. So when we make these changes, it, it can be very, very disruptive to the group. And the other challenge, of course, is 
space? Where do we put animals once they've been removed from a social group? And so these are all the different things that we are um, struggling with at this point with these with um, with cotton tops. The other challenge that we have is this issue of reproduction. So it's amazing to think that this little one pound monkey is pregnant with twins for about six months. Can you imagine a one pound monkey gives birth to twins? Those twins weigh about 15% of her body weight. So that's like a, a, a human woman giving birth to two 10 pound infants. I know it's amazing. So females are nursing these babies and in captivity, they have an 18 day postpartum ovulation and 80% of those ovulations result in a new pregnancy. So in captivity, females give birth approximately every 28 weeks and there's this tiny little window uh, in which they're not pregnant. In the wild, it's somewhat different. They give birth typically once a year and there is a suppression of fertility due to lactation but we don't see that in captivity because they have this constant food supply. So as you can imagine, if you're trying to move females around, you have a short opportunity in which you can do that and you have to think about contracepting them. So uh, you have an 18 day window once a female gives birth to contracept her. And then um, you also have to think about her daughters because it, we typically will also contracept daughters because we know that sometimes when females are contracepted and their estrogen levels are lower, um, we do have aggression between the mom and daughters. So we typically will then contracept all females. So again, how do we move females around, uh, replace new females? It becomes quite challenging when you have to take all of these things into consideration. And then of course, finally, it's space. Uh, right now in zoos, there's a limited number of uh, space and we really have to work very closely with our institutions so that they continue to see the value of displaying cotton top tamarind. You know, many zoos have decided that their uh, collection needs to be smaller. They don't wanna necessarily have a postage stamp collection of all the different primates of the world. They really wanna focus on a few and particularly because they wanna get more involved in conservation, we've been working very hard with a lot of our zoo partners to be able to have them join us in protecting cotton tops in the wild. Um, and the, one of the things that we really want our zoo partners to talk about is this idea of cotton tops as pets. You know, today, and you will see it both in the United States and around the world, people will oftentimes try to sell cotton top tamarins. Again, this is an endangered species, it's very illegal. Um, and so we have to work long and hard to make sure that these animals don't end up in the pet trade and that they have a quality of life, right? That is the, for us, it's making sure that these animals are work well cared for and do not end up um, being exploited. So when we think about this, uh, how we manage our population in the zoos, we typically every year will review our population to see if we're meeting our population goals, which is trying to maintain the genetic diversity well over 90% for the next 50 years. And we really have to look at each of our groups that we have reproducing and determine whether we've got the right balance of genetics, behavior, reproduction, and space, right? Um, and again, they don't always receive, they're not always weighted equally because they, we have to take so many things into consideration and space is one of our limiting factors. So our goal with cotton tops is really to slow down reproduction, so, but still maintain high genetic diversity. Now that's great um, for how we manage animals in captivity, but what do we do with managing animals in the wild? Well, as I mentioned, we don't have a genetic marker, but we're currently working with the Copenhagen Zoo, who is working on developing using this technique called MobiSeq, which is allows the sequencing of hundreds of thousands of loci across the, the genome. And it really will allow us to find uh, new genetic markers that will hopefully uh, show diversity in this species. So I'm happy to tell you that our partners in Copenhagen are frantically at work. Um, they're starting with museum specimens to see if they can't find some diversity. And the interesting thing about that is if we can find the markers, we'll be able to look at how much gen genetic diversity has lost, has been lost from, you know, looking at museum specimens to um, looking at where we are today, both in our captive situation as well as in the wild. So until we have that information, our goal with our population in Colombia is to try and maintain the opportunity for cotton top tamarins to move through the forest 
Now, um, we did a population census and there's only about 7,500 cotton top tamarins left in the wild, which is not very many individuals when you think about it. Um, so what we have been able to do is we are working very long and hard looking at where cotton tops are found within their historic distribution and trying to connect forest fragments so that we can maintain this um, movement of animals so that they can move freely and that we don't end up with all these isolated forest patches. Um, and that's something that for us has been really important. So the two primary threats that we work with with our wild animals is the loss of forest habitat, where you know we have uh, big agricultural issues with populations increasing in many areas where cotton tops are found, human populations, and they then compete for the same resources that cotton tops uh, that cotton tops need to survive. The other issue, of course, is this whole challenge that we have with the pet trade. You know, many people, whether you're here in the United States or around the world, think monkeys make good pets, and Colombia is no exception. We have a real challenge with people wanting to have cotton tops as pets. So we, uh, with our program in Colombia, work very hard on protecting forests for cotton tops, and then we work to limit and try and reduce people's interest in having cotton tops as pets. So we have created a, a conservation organization called Proyecto TT, and our mission is to protect the cotton top tamarins that remain in Colombia by working with communities so that we can protect forests for cotton tops and ensure their long-term survival in Colombia. Now, the only way we can do that is by getting local people involved, and we need people to understand why it's so important to save the species. So we have a long-term uh, research program that looks at the social behavior, reproduction, everything that you can imagine, what from everything from what they eat to where they sleep in the wild. Uh, we also then do a lot of work with communities because, you know, conservation is a people problem, right? We need people to get engaged. We need people to really care about the species and we need people to change their behavior so that they do the right thing to help save the species. The other thing that we have to deal with and be very realistic is that particularly in many of the places where cotton tops are found, they're surrounded by communities that live in poverty. So if we don't address some of the basic issues that these communities need, that we can never get them involved in conservation. So we have spent a lot of time working with communities on different sustainable development programs so that they become sort of our uh, environmental entrepreneurs, so they become our champions for local conservation efforts. So one of our biggest accomplishments is that we have worked long and hard in trying to protect, set up, establish protected areas for cotton top tamarins. Uh, we have created four protected areas totaling over 15,000 acres of habitat for cotton tops. And we are involved in major reforestation programs along with many other partners in Colombia trying to connect some of these large tracts of forest so that cotton top tamarins will continue to have a future in the wild. We're also very committed to dealing with this issue of having cotton tops as pets. And this is where dogs come in because dogs have really saved the day with all of this. Um, when we started talking to our communities and really looking at um, where this all came from, this idea of wanting to have a cotton top as a pet, it's because most people that live in these rural communities in Colombia don't necessarily view their dogs or cats or their domestic animals as pets, right? They really viewed them as having a function. Your dog in many of these rural communities is almost like your doorbell because it's barking when somebody comes, it's guarding different things, and it's there just, uh, it has a role to play in the family. But in a lot of these rural communities, and I'm sure many of you who've traveled the world have seen that many of these dogs don't have a great life right? It's uh, different. M most of these dogs uh, don't get very good day-to-day -day care. Uh, they're often dealing with lots of disease issues, and they're oftentimes dealt with, you know, the, it's all very, uh, their lives are with a lot of punishment and negative reinforcement. It's, it's sort of uh, tough things. It's, most of the training that goes on with dogs and in these rural communities is what they use, which is called the chancla method, which is the shoe, right? There is all being, animals are, are hit and, and basically, you know, told not to do things and they're yelled at. They don't get a lot of praise. And so one of the things that we wanted to do is see if we couldn't 
try and change people's attitudes and behaviors around having cotton tops, I mean, having cotton tops as pets, meaning can we redirect this interest in wanting to have a little monkey that doesn't really make a good pet to having a dog that's right there into being a great pet. And so our idea was, can we turn kids into dog trainers so that they will see how smart their dogs are and then want to really get involved and have a dog as a pet. So we created this program called Ami Guau. Amigo, which is friend. Guau is what they say. Dogs say instead of bow wow, they say guau wow. So this is my friend, the dog. And the whole program works with kids that have been part of through of our, um, our education programs that talk about cotton top tamarins. And we teach kids how to care for their dogs. Uh, we give them uh, bowls so that they can decorate them with the dog's name. We teach kids even simple things like how to pet a dog. And while we take that as second nature, a lot of these kids that live in these rural communities, they don't have that kind of relationship. In fact, they don't even have that kind of relationship necessarily in their family. So we look at how to build a strong bond. We also teach kids how to read their dog's behavior. Um, there's some really fun activities that we do with ears and tails. Um, and, and we then teach them how to make even like little dog biscuits that they can make at home. So they become the chef for their dog. And so all of this is working on how to create this great bond. And the kids feel very responsible now for this animal. But one of the most exciting things is to see how these kids become master trainers. Um, we do everything through positive reinforcement. As you can imagine, these dogs are very food motivated, so we can use dog treats uh, and teach them how to target. And we basically will teach kids how to train their dog to do a series of very simple behaviors. And this has been remarkably successful in getting kids to really become interested in caring for their dog. So we go from a dog that has lived outside its entire time on a very, very short lease to becoming a member of the family in a very positive way. So it's a great opportunity both for the dog and for the kids. And what's really fun is to see how these kids have just taken on, um, you know, training their dogs to do even more things. And it's even better because our, some of our kids will go and train their neighbor's dogs because they get so excited by all of this. Um, and so this program has really been very impactful in the lives of children and wanting to have dogs as pets rather than monkeys. And this is a huge step forward for all of us that are working to try and conserve this species. So I just wanted to sort of wrap this up with saying, if you're interested in learning more about the work that we do with Cotton Top Tamarins and our connections with uh, our dog program, you can visit Preactive TT at uh, preactivett.com. We're also on all the various social media channels. And this is a great opportunity to see how we can keep this connection between dogs, monkeys, and people together. So thank you very much for uh, your attention. And I'd be happy to uh, answer some of the questions that are in the chat. So um, how do we keep such high genetic diversity within the captive cotton top tamarind population? Um, that is done through very meticulous breeding of animals. So we have been able to move some animals from Europe and Australia into the US population. Um, and again, using this mean kinship. So this is how related, you know, again, animals come in as every animal is a founder. So there is a, a bit of a flaw there, but we have do, but we have really worked long and hard to make sure that when we're pairing animals together, we're doing it to maximize genetic diversity. And so um, we've been very fortunate to be able to do that. Now, um, so there's another question asking us, have, have we been able to track health and longevity and fertility related to genetic diversity? Um, I will tell you that in uh, captivity, we have about an 85% survival rate of our animals, which is pretty remarkable. Um, so we don't, we haven't seen anything that would suggest that we've got any type of genetic abnormalities happening in our captive situation. In the wild, our um, fertility is very high. In fact, uh, infant survival to six months is at about 67%. Uh, we don't, I can tell you the primary causes of death are typically when animals are learning to walk on their own, they either get preyed upon or they get, they fall. And so that's the issue. We have not, knock on wood, seen anything that we would suggest or any type of genetic ab abnormalities. And, you know, I've been working in Colombia since 1987. So I'm happy to tell you that so far, so good. We haven't seen anything that suggests 
that um, this is this is an issue. Um, when it comes to looking at our, the true genetics, we and sadly uh, we have not been able to do any of the the work that has happened with a lot of different species. My hope is that when we get this work done by the Copenhagen Zoo that we will really have the genetic markers now to go back and really look to see whether we have this high level of diversity in our captive population and our wild population. So we have been collecting samples from our wild animals. Again, the Copenhagen Zoo has a variety of samples that they've obtained in Europe. We're also working to get samples from the United States. And you know we're hoping that within the next year or two, we will, um, be able to uh, continue this this work and have a better understanding. Um, yes, yeah, so someone is asking with animals that have been excluded from the SSP because their parentage has been unknown. Once we have this uh, new MobiSeq information, and again, hopefully it will be in the next year or two, um, we would be able to integrate a lot of these animals, assuming that they have the social skills that are needed. Uh, and again, that becomes one of the biggest challenges when we have these animals that are confiscated from the pet trade or roadside zoos. Uh, if they have not had that early infant caretaking experience, they won't be good parents. If we can somehow trace back that these animals are effective breeders and they're valuable genetically, I think they definitely would be included in the, the population. So, um, you know, we're, we remain very hopeful from that. Um, in terms of our Amiguao program, there's a question about, is there an organized volunteer tourism program focused on the dog training? Um, I will tell you that uh, in 2019, we had started a very successful ecotourism program uh, in Colombia to come see cottontop tamarins. Uh, and sadly, due to COVID, we've had to close all of our ecotourism activities. Uh, we you know, the challenge that we always have is that we need people who can speak Spanish because people who work in our local communities our challenge with speaking English. We have uh, worked with some animal keepers from Disney's Animal Kingdom that came to train our education staff on teaching kids how to train. Um, so it's sort of the train the trainer program. So our staff now is really good at training dogs and little do they know that that would be one of the things that they're doing. And again, we're talking simple behaviors but they really, really enjoy it. And in fact, you should see their even their own home pets now do more things than ever before. So um, we're really, really excited about that. Um, so, so here's the thing. So is there any room for those who still keep cotton tops as pets to become advocates for keeping up their genetic diversity, much like having zoo partners to increase zoo population events, um, population diversity. So I think the issue is that, you know, anybody who has cotton tops as pets, we want to make sure, um, one, that they're well cared for, right? Obviously, that's one of the most important things that we're providing the best environment for these animals. Uh, and in terms of whether they'll be introduced back to a managed population or be part of that is still very much up in the air. I think until we know um, what is going on with our genetics with the species, we, we really won't have an answer. But I think one of the most important things is that we do not want to be breeding more cotton top tamarins in situations that are not optimal for their survival. And so we have been working very hard, particularly in Colombia, to make sure that the, the pet trade is um, diminished, or at least the desire to have cotton tops is diminished. Because as you can imagine, we, um, it's a challenging uh, opportunity for many of these people you know it's when communities don't have a way to make money they're going to go into the forest and they try and capture cotton tops and sell them into the pet trade and they go after the the babies now parents don't willingly give up their their offspring so they have to usually take a slingshot or do something else to get the adult who's carrying the baby and there's a lot of loss of life that's involved when capturing a lot of these animals for the pet trade and it, the disintegration of the group, of the entire social group. So for one cotton top tamarind that is taken from the wild, there are many other that perish in alongside of them. So our goal is really to work very hard in Colombia to decrease the interest in having cotton tops as a pet and really and thereby reducing the number of animals that are kept in the wild. So, um, you know, and again, we work with our zoo partners and we're open to anybody who's very interested in working with us. We, um, we always look forward to uh, donations of any type of 
dog collars or anything that we can use in our Omiguao program. Uh, because of course, you know, as you can imagine, kids don't have a lot of things and uh, we've got clickers and, you know, all those different things that we are using to train our dogs. So um, we welcome the opportunity to partner with any of you if you're interested in getting more involved with Proyecto TT. And uh, I want to thank you very, very much for this opportunity to speak with you today. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Thank you very much, Dr. Savage. That was great. Well, thank you. Yeah, um, I mean, it's always fascinating to apply insights learned from research on one species to the needs and challenges of another. Uh, there were tons of comments going on the, the public page there. So I know all of us in the dog world here have really enjoyed hearing from you today. Um, I did wanna actually ask you one other question. Um, it's something that we see discussed among breed organizations quite a bit. Um, you mentioned earlier that the stud book for cotton top tamarins assumes that every animal that was originally imported is not related to anyone else, all founders. Right. And this is an assumption we see used in some dog breed populations as well with select founding dogs. So can you just speak to what the impact of this assumption has been in the cotton top tamarin? And are there any lessons there you've learned that could be helpful to breeders thinking about their breed populations? Well, I think if you've got the tools available to be able to determine the genetic diversity, you would definitely want to use that because you could accidentally be creating lines that are very inbred based on this idea of mean kinship. Um, you know, uh, we have worked long and hard trying to figure out when it comes to looking at how related these animals are, looking at where they were captured. And that's one of the ways that we can say, well, it's unlikely that an animal captured at site A is related to animals at site B because of the distance of where they were captured from. But if two groups of animals come from the same site, you know, based on the work where we've been following animals for years and years, a lot of times they're fairly related or, you know, somewhat related to their neighbors. So there is this challenge of using mean kinship and assuming that everyone is a founder. Right. Right. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you very much again for your perspective. And um, again, we've, we've really appreciated hearing from you here today. So thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so much.